I've always wondered, what is the root cause of all of that damage in my neck? And that's how I arrived at jaw hacks. My hypothesis for myself, and what I later found was maybe this can apply to lots of other people. My hypothesis was, okay, so my neck is screwed up. Mm-hmm. Well, what what's going on at my neck? Well, my neck posture is definitely chin forward. It's definitely not healthy according to some of these people who define what good posture is. Mm-hmm. There's an obvious problem there. Mm-hmm. Well, then why do I have poor neck posture? That doesn't seem to be a root cause either because humans are, are not born with bad neck posture. So what happened with me? Then I thought, okay, well, maybe it's my jaws because I have this bad bite and because um, visually, you know, I, well, it's known I'm missing eight teeth. I had four, I had four premolar extractions. I had four wisdom teeth extractions. My mouth is not at its full biological potential. (coughs) Mm -hmm. Then I later discovered having a small airway can cause poor neck posture. Mm -hmm. And so what I've arrived at is that the root cause of my headaches So we just walk it back A to B to C. Nerve compression, Mm -hmm. bad neck posture, caused by small airway, caused by, and this is a very speculative area, but some people say, you know, malocclusion and and small jaws are caused by environment. Some say it's genetic. It's probably a mixture of both. Mm -hmm. Um, What do you think of the idea that small jaws causing poor neck posture could be a root cause of compression of nerves in the neck. Yeah, I think it's actually a very plausible idea. I don't think that any anything that you just said is out of the realm of not only possibility, but reasonableness. Um, And and I'll give you another perfect example. There was an article I ran into, this is about seven or eight years ago. Uh, It was written by uh, an internet, uh, you know, tech blogger, whose name, unfortunately, don't even remember, but uh, it said uh, that, or the title of the article was, my cell phone gave me a neurological condition. And it was talking about how with the neck forward posture that many people adopt when they're constantly looking down on their cell phones, uh, they have certain pressure that they put on all the soft tissues in their neck. And in fact, the study was mated with a recent paper that was uh, just published at the time that showed that Uh, with as little as 30 degrees of neck flexion, the amount of pressure per square inch was about 60 PSI that you were putting on all the soft tissues, which of course includes arteries and veins and the airways and the nerves. And so um, the idea that a forward neck posture, that a small airway, which by definition, in many cases, people try to overcome by holding their neck a certain way to open that airway up. So, you know, uh, you know, when people have small airways, when people have obstructive sleep apnea at night, when their airways collapse for any number of reasons, they will hold their heads in certain ways to try and minimize that collapse to allow more oxygen to flow and so you can breathe. It's almost reflexive. Like if you put your finger on a hot stove, you don't think, hey, geez, my finger really hurts right now. Maybe I should move it away. It just moves away before you even can think, ouch, that really hurt. Um, so these things happen reflexively. And I think that your postulates are actually really good ones. And I think that it would be really interesting to try and think about how to study that phenomenon. Because I think that whether you're talking about a congenitally small airway or one that's uh, collapsible, for example, if your tracheal rings aren't as strong as uh you know, your quote, average bears, uh, when you have some type of malocclusive problem that will cause spasticity of certain muscles to try and compensate for that so that you can chew effectively, uh, which will then kind of tug on other muscles in the neck that will hopefully then allow you to do that, which will cause biomechanical compensatory mechanisms and pressures on the nerves that you wouldn't normally get. So a perfect example of that are patients with Ehlers-Danlos where they have hypermobile joints. And so, you know, they're the kinds of people that can take this in a million years. I can't get my thumb to touch my wrist, but these people will bend their thumbs. You know, my daughter can do this and her thumb touches her wrist. You know, when your neck joints move like that, the nerves in the neck, along with the arteries and blood vessels, why a lot of those people will develop aortic aneurysms, 
um, they will also get stretched in ways that you know they theoretically shouldn't, and that can cause all sorts of issues. So I think your ideas are actually really interesting and probably very plausible. Uh, I think it's it's you know the what what would ultimately be needed, um, as we've seen with our surgical headache literature, is ultimately a good way to study this phenomenon. But I think it's a very a plausible idea. Just spitballing, you said earlier that uh, chronic headaches were on the rise. So is sleep apnea, mm-hmm. which indicates that small airways are on the rise and that poor neck posture as a maladaptation to compensate for the small airway is on the rise. And Mm -hmm. obviously we can't prove anything, but I think there may be a connection there. And, you know, the success of my channel and the success of the orthotropics channel, which basically specializes in, you know, environmental causes of undersized airways, that's Dr. Mike Mew, it's huge. And this is, this kind of uh, space is really taking over large swaths of the internet. It's a huge problem. Mm-hmm. And what's a mystery to me is why not everyone suffers from headaches who have this problem. It seems to be hit or miss. And anytime I see someone who I chat with who has horrible facial structure, terrible neck posture, you know, neck strain, <coughs> but then mm-hmm. when I say, hey, do you get headaches? They say no. And I say, thank God that you don't right. because it's horrible. Yeah. But it seems to be hit or miss. Well, and so, and it's actually not as hit or miss as you would think. So let me give you a a good analogy. Uh, The number one cause for neuropathy, that is some kind of pathology, usually uh, an an unexplained, quote unquote, tingling in the usually fingers or toes. But the number one cause of neuropathy worldwide is diabetes. What happens in diabetes? You have extra glucose rolling around. Even with the best glucose control, all the insulin, all the medicines in the world, pancreatic transplants, what have you, you're baseline glucose level is higher than that of a non-diabetic. What happens is that glucose gets metabolized and brought into certain cells, including the nerve cells. And in the nerve cells themselves, the glucose is metabolized to another sugar known as sorbitol. Sorbitol acts as what's called an osmotic load. So it basically draws water into the nerve to balance out the water content outside of the nerve with that of the nerve within the nerve itself now that this sugar is in there, okay? So basically, when you are diabetic, your nerves are swollen. And if you have a space like the carpal tunnel that is this big and your nerve is this big, your median nerve, then as the wrist flexes back and forth, that nerve glides back and forth without a problem and nothing's pressing. Works. If all of a sudden the nerve is this big and it's trying to glide through the same space, now you have kinking back and forth because it's barely fitting in there. And you get micro trauma that occurs repetitively over time and eventually you become symptomatic. Now, the question is, why, kind of like to the uh, story you were alluding to with you know people with horrible neck posture who don't have headaches, why is it that there are people who have diabetes, they never check their sugars, they eat cake and things they shouldn't eat all the time, never get carpal tunnel syndrome, And then you have people who were diagnosed with diabetes last week and are testing every minute of every day and their blood sugar is never above 140, which, you know, for diabetic is really pretty amazing, even after a meal or especially after a meal. And yet they get symptoms of carpal tunnel syndrome within a few weeks of being diagnosed. And the simple answer is, and we have literature that shows this, not everybody's carpal tunnel is the same size, right? So if your carpal wow. tunnel is the size of the Lincoln Tunnel, and obviously I'm being dramatic here, <laughs> your nerves can swell many times their normal size and you can be completely remiss about checking your blood sugars, but you will never have pressure on your nerves. And then there are people who are born with carpal tunnels through which their median nerves barely fit at baseline. So as soon as there's even a micron of swelling in that nerve diameter, all of a sudden that nerve has pressure on it from the inside out because the nerve is trying to expand, but there's no room. So now it's got pressure on it and they become symptomatic. And in the headache world, the way that translates, because there are many people like yourself who will say, you know, I never had any trauma. I didn't fall off a horse. I didn't get beamed by a baseball, uh, you know, at the company softball game. I didn't, uh, you know, I wasn't judo wrestling. 
uh, or anything like that. Uh, but, but I have these headaches. I don't know why they just showed up one day. In many of those cases, when you operate on those people, the branching patterns for, let's just take the best example, the greater occipital nerve, but it applies to any nerve, is not the normal pattern that you see. And so, for example, for the greater occipital nerve, the typical branching pattern is that you have one big greater occipital nerve trunk that passes through all the muscles in the neck until it gets past the cranial base, at which point the nerve is now subcutaneous. It's just under the skin and all that soft subcutaneous fat that we all have. And there's no further compressive points. And that's when the nerve starts to branch out. And in many cases, those people will probably never get headaches no matter how many times they kind of bang their head, even just a little bit, or sleep funny on it. Most people don't think about sleeping funny as a, a trauma. If you contrast that with the person who said, yeah, you know, I slept funny one night, I woke up with a headache and it just never went away. When you operate on that person, what I've seen many times is that their greater occipital nerves have these little tiny branches that start to branch off within the muscle. And so if you look at the tree that's outside my office, uh, if you look at the trunk of that tree and there's a 50 mile an hour wind gust that blows as the weather you know, does blow quite often here in San Francisco, that thing doesn't even move. The tree trunk is solid, it's huge, it's very hardy and nothing is gonna make that thing move. But yet that same 50 mile an hour wind gust will snap off one of the little downstream branches. Well, if you have those little downstream twigs that come off right, right off the trunk, and you sleep funny on it, that's the 50 mile an hour gust, the branch breaks off, and now you have a little branch neuroma, a little injured nerve branch that got tweaked or torn because it was small and, and is not as strong as the main trunk. And so something seemingly innocuous is kind of sleeping on it a little funny is what causes the trauma. So to the analogy that you were making, you know, that patient who has the really unusual posture that you would think, God, that's you know got to be causing some issue with your airway and probably does. And that person does not have headaches. They might have the more typical branching pattern that is protective for becoming symptomatic. Whereas someone who has that quote unquote abnormal branching pattern is predisposed to having issues when they have to move their neck even slightly off what is quote unquote normal. So there's lots of ways to explain that type of phenomenon. It's actually pretty common.